Здравствуйте, дорогие друзья! Hi everyone, thank you for watching this. Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy published in 1878 is his most popular novel. Tolstoy himself called Anna Karenina his first true novel, though published eight years after his masterpiece War and Peace, which I discussed already on this channel. In this video, I'll summarize Anna Karenina while highlighting Tolstoy's genius storytelling techniques and discuss its major themes by answering the following questions. First, what is the novel about? Who are its major characters? Why was Tolstoy obsessed with the theme of family? What is Tolstoy's view on happiness and fulfillment in life? And finally, what is the role of railway in this novel? Summary Part 1 the first thing you should know is that Anna Karenina is about romance and family life. The novel begins with one of the most famous first lines in literature. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. The novel centers on three important married couples. Anna and Alexei Karenin in St. Petersburg, Dolly and Steva Oblonsky in Moscow, and Kitty and Kostya Levin in the countryside. But the crafty Tolstoy also throws a wild card into the mix, in the shape of a charming bachelor officer, Alexei Vronsky, who steers things and destabilizes the lives of these couples, and even questions the institution of marriage. All these people are aristocrats, so there is no Cinderella fairy tale of poor marrying rich here. It's all rich people having real troubles with their marriages. Let's start with the least important couple. It's Dolly and Steve Oblonsky who have a rocky marriage due to Steve's affairs. But Dolly eventually forgives him and they remain married. They live in Moscow, the city that is still has that old Russian charm, a bit warmer and friendlier than St. Petersburg. Tolstoy used Dolly and Steve to teach the other two couples a lesson, by virtue of their mistakes, but also through mediation and go-between. The second couple is Kitty and Kostya Levin, who when we meet are not married, who start on a very rocky grounds, but despite their difficulties, they are perhaps the most content couple in Anna Karenina. Also Levin of this novel is Leo or Lev Tolstoy himself, bookish, philosophical, awkward, not so handsome, but who works really hard to be a better person, a better husband and better citizen. Even his name Konstantin means constant, a man who constantly tries to strengthen his foundation. They live in the country like Tolstoy himself, with life being slightly simpler. Now the most important married couple in the novel is Anna and Alexei Karenin. Anna is incredibly beautiful, and Karenin, her husband, is a career-driven man with an important government job, who takes his duties extremely seriously to the point that Anna is bored of him, as though she is married to an investment banker today. Or some computer nerd, not romantic, not passionate, and not adventurous. They live in St. Petersburg, the most westernized Russian city, so climatically and culturally cold and bureaucratic. But they have an eight-year-old son, Sergei. Then comes the bachelor Vronsky on a white horse like some medieval knight in shiny armor, who snatches Anna away from Karenin. Vronsky is a horse-racing army officer, whom Dostoevsky describes as a man who cannot stop talking about horses. In today's world, he is like a man who drives a Ferrari or Lamborghini. Before expensive cars, men rode horses to attract women. So the arrival of Vronsky steers two major characters in the novel. First, it's Kitty, who Levin wants to get married to. But Vronsky, like the bad boy of his day, doesn't want to deal with a single woman. He is after a bigger prize. He wants Anna, a married woman. Now we have drama, heartbreaks, and even tragedies. So we have our fourth couple, Anna and Vronsky, unmarried and shunned by society, who become the most adventurous of all couples in the novel, as they escape Russia to Italy and back to St. Petersburg, then to countryside, then to Moscow, but they find no place of peace. The old saying, the rolling stone gathers no moss. Vronsky being a soldier is like a nomadic person, while very attractive, also destroys Anna's psyche. Anna Karenina has several parallel stories. The main plot centers on Anna who leaves her husband Karenin for another man, Vronsky, so we have a love triangle. The second story is Levin's marriage to Kitty, but it's the story of Anna and her lover Vronsky that will be the focus of this summary. We meet Anna at the train station where she witnesses a man falling to his death in front of a moving train. This is like Chekhov's gun, that if you show a gun in the first scene, it must go off by the end of the story. Also important to note that trains were very new in Russia at the time. 
Here Anna also meets the handsome officer Vronsky, who when noticing the beautiful Anna decides to generously donate money to the family of the unfortunate train victim who got killed, to show off that he is a good man of good heart. Men become generous when they meet the beautiful lady, so Anna is very impressed by Vronsky. Also women tend to like soldiers. Tolstoy also tells us that Anna's brother Steva is unfaithful to his wife Dolly, so their marriage is on the verge of a breakdown. This is the second Chekhovian gun. First, a man is killed by the train, the second, Anna's brother is cheating on his wife. So if the brother is capable of cheating, it's possible her sister Anna is also capable of cheating. But first, Anna is a peacemaker between her brother and his wife Dolly. She tells Dolly that it's no big deal, men cheat all the time, but he still loves you. Dolly is convinced, well that was easy. Then comes Dolly's younger sister, Kitty, who is just 18 and ready to get married. She has an eye on the same man Anna saw at the train station, the generous army officer, Mr. Vronsky. But wait a minute, there is this guy called Levin, who sounds like Leo Tolstoy himself. A rich landowner, a large man and not best looking, but you know, reliable. Levin gets to one knee and proposes to Kitty, but Kitty rejects him and sends him back to his village, because she thinks she can do better. Meow. She wants Vronsky. Levin is a country leopard and Vronsky is a real tiger. Siberian tiger, just kidding. But here's the tragedy, tigers don't settle for Kitty because it's too easy. Vronsky rejects Kitty and pursues Anna, a married woman instead. Anna says, I'm married. But at the same time, seeing how Vronsky ruthlessly rejected Kitty, she really wants him now. The old saying, women want a man who is capable of rejecting other women. But Anna remains strong and says no to Vronsky. So we have three rejections already. Levin is rejected by Kitty, Kitty is rejected by Vronsky, Vronsky is rejected by Anna. Everyone is heartbroken, miserable and sick. This is only the first round, seven more rounds to go. Levin returns to the countryside, Anna returns home in St. Petersburg. But now everything looks different for her. Seeing her husband, Mr. Karenin, a boring but reliable government official, there is a hurricane inside Anna. She is unsettled. To make matters worse, Vronsky follows her to St. Petersburg. The man does not take no for an answer. Summary Part 2 Ok, things move a lot faster from now on. Anna gives in to Vronsky's pursuit and they have an affair. Anna's husband, a trusting, naive man, is oblivious. Maybe a little too soft compared to Vronsky who is so strong that he actually breaks a grown up horse. During a horse race, he falls and the animal's back is broken, so must be killed. With one life gone, another is on the horizon. Anna is pregnant with Vronsky's love child. Anna breaks the news to her husband, I'm sorry but I had sex with this man on the horse. Karenin is shocked, but he kind of knew. Here is something interesting in Russian literature, perhaps for the first time we have a new breed of Russian characters, modernized and sensible enough not to challenge his rival to a duel. Karenin thinks to himself, quote, A duel is quite irrational and no one expected of me. My aim is simply to safeguard my reputation, which is essential for the uninterrupted pursuit of my public duties. Karenin is a nice man, so he tells Anna that he will forgive her if she stops the affair. Unfortunately, nice men finish last, at least in this case. Anna continues her affair, Karenin begs her but Anna has made up her mind. She wants a divorce, damn it. Karenin has no power so he uses their son, Sergei, as a bargaining chip to get at her. But Anna is not coming back. While giving birth to Vronsky's daughter, Anna almost dies. Seeing her like that, Karenin feels sorry and decides to forgive both Anna and her lover Vronsky. Seeing such a massive gesture, Vronsky is so embarrassed for stealing such a good man's wife that he wants to commit suicide. Russians are men of their words, but Vronsky is not a good shot, so he misses the target, I mean himself, and he survives his suicide attempt. Anna also recovers from childbirth. She and Vronsky are happy together, finally. But Vronsky being an officer is told by the army to move to Central Asia. He doesn't want to go to Central Asia. To skip it all, here the lovers decide to leave the motherland for some freedom and pizza in Italy. Seeing them gone, Karenin tells his young son that her mother is dead. Ok, meanwhile what happened to our second tale, the romance of Levin and Kitty? After rejection, Levin takes up gardening to distract himself. 
I'm only kidding, he has a large country state to manage. He goes deep into the philosophy of farming and how land shapes your views, how Russians are deeply attached to their lands and how the motherland shapes the Russian identity and how Russia is so different from Europe. You get the point. Kitty, however, says forget Russia, forget motherland. She travels to Germany for some beer and sausage. No, she's actually quite sick after being rejected by Vronsky. While in Germany for a bit, she soon gets sick of Germany, so she returns to the motherland. Around this time, Levin almost marries a village babushka, I mean a peasant woman. But then he meets Kitty again, and with the help of others, they reconcile, get engaged, and soon marry. They move to the country where they have plenty of fights, they make a lot of love, they make some babies, well, just like any other couples out there. Meanwhile, Anna and Vronsky find themselves very isolated in Italy and they are fed up with pizza and amaretto. No friends to socialize with and they start to get tired of each other. Their love or lust alone doesn't make them happy. Human, huh? Nothing makes humans happy. Quote, Vronsky, meanwhile, in spite of the complete realization of what he had so long desired, was not perfectly happy. He soon felt that the realization of his desires gave him no more than a grain of sand out of the mountain of happiness he had expected. It showed him the mistake men make, picturing to themselves happiness as the realization of their desires. Ciao Italia and their return to Russia. St. Petersburg, here we come. But, back on the Russian soil, things are very different. Anna is totally ostracized by everyone she knew, so she remains indoor, alone, and disgraced. Vronsky, however, is free to go around, meet and mingle with everyone. Damn, devil standard. I guess Vronsky was a single man, so nobody blames him. But Anna was a mother and a wife, so everyone blames her. Anna starts analyzing, overthinking, then gets paranoid with Vronsky's activities outside. Every time Vronsky comes home, she smells his clothes for any scent of some other woman. Kidding, but you get the point, she is going mad. She decides to visit her son, Sergei, on his ninth birthday in the middle of the night. This is one of the most moving scenes in the novel as the boy is half asleep, Karenin wakes up and sees Anna with the boy and she leaves. It's heartbreaking. Still, the man doesn't want to divorce her in the hope she might return to him. But Anna continues to fight tooth and nail to be with Vronsky despite all the hostilities. Anna's had enough of sitting alone at home, so she decides not to give a shit about what people think, so she goes to theater. But she is so insulted by her own friends that she and Vronsky decide to leave St. Petersburg for a second time. This time they head to the countryside for some peace. Here Tolstoy compares the two couples side by side. Levin and Kitty have a more modest and simple life. They still have their issues, like jealousy and other things. Anna and Vronsky, however, have a more lavish lifestyle. Despite the flashy and glitzy facade, Anna's deeply unhappy and jealous when Vronsky is not around. Countryside gets boring too, they decide to move to Moscow. Things get from bad to worse for Anna. Now she has discovered drugs, morphine, to ease her pain of jealousy and paranoia. Love is the definition of irrationality and madness. She thinks Vronsky is having sex with multiple women. Moscow is no different from St. Petersburg. People judge you just the same. The scandal follows them wherever they go like some dark shadow. Anna and Vronsky have a big fight because Vronsky wants to go to his mother for a few days. Anna thinks it's all over for her. She decides to follow him. At the train station, just like the beginning of the novel, Tolstoy fires Chekhov's gun. Anna throws herself in front of a moving train to complete our Russian tragedy that started at train station, continued into the bedroom, and ended in the train station. Here's a quote. And the light by which she had read books filled with troubles, falsehood, sorrow, and evil flared up more brightly than ever before lighted up for her all that had been in darkness, flickered, began to grow dim, and was quenched forever. With Anna's death, the novel doesn't stop. She wasn't the only protagonist in the novel. Tolstoy didn't center his novels on an individual protagonist or hero, but several of them, because he believed in the power of society in groups, not individuals. Just in War and Peace, when a man's not happy, he goes to war. Vronsky joins the army to defend fellow Slavs in Bulgaria against the Turks, hoping to die in the war. Anna's husband, Karenin, takes the custody of both kids. Our other couple, Levin and Kitty, continue to have their struggles, have babies, fight and make love. Levin becomes religious in an attempt to discover himself and be a better person, only to realize that nothing can make him a perfect person. He accepts life's imperfection. Quote, 
When Levin thought what he was and what he was living for, he could find no answer to the question and would choose to despair. So he decides to just live without really analyzing it too much. That is it. Life is meant to be lived, not analyzed too much. Life goes on. Family. After reading War and Peace, you notice Anna Karenina is a much simpler novel in its language, plot, and ambition. Tolstoy is more relaxed as he has no ambition to challenge history or Napoleon. Instead, he tackles marriage, the oldest institution in human history. For millennia, family has stood the test of time. But with the arrival of modernity, we have individual freedom, and now we find couples initially in love, but find each other unbearable as time goes on. Tolstoy highlights St. Petersburg as the most modern city of bureaucrats, where Anna and Karenin, the coldest couple, live. Dolly and Steve are a bit warm in Moscow, where aristocrats live. And Levin and Kitty in the country are the warmest couple in the novel, where landed gentry live. So the more modern you are, the less warmth there is between couples. Karenin represents the new bureaucratic class, maintaining the machinery of the state. They are efficient, boring, and reliable. Aristocrats, on the other hand, are old-fashioned, judgmental, and deeply ingrained in their own ways. Karenin is deeply open-minded and is willing to accept Anna despite her affairs. This is totally unacceptable among the aristocrats. Also, St. Petersburg, being farther north, is literally cold and metaphorically cold, while Moscow still has that Russian warmth. For Tolstoy, family is the best way to live, have kids, and be productive in society. It gives men their role to provide for their family and give women their role to nurture their kids. But with modern individualism, people don't know how to reconcile individual freedom with familial and social duties. Anna fails in her duty as a mother and wife, but fulfills her individual goal of pursuing happiness, but ends tragically. She is goal-oriented and driven. Karenin and Levin, on the other hand, sticks to their duty as husband, father, and good citizen. Levin is more likable because he struggles to be good and ultimately sticks to his gender role. Tolstoy shows that women's transgressions are less tolerated in society, especially in high society who are supposed to keep traditions and norms. Anna is severely punished, while Vronsky is not. You might say because she was a woman, but you could also say Anna was a wife and a mother. Vronsky was a single man. Vronsky's transgression didn't hurt anyone, but Anna's did. It hurt her husband and their child. Society controls our carnal desires, like parents put rules on their kids. I guess Tolstoy tells us that you should drive your happiness from your duty as a good partner, parent, or citizen. Happiness Tolstoy says happiness is nothing but illusion and mirage. The grass wasn't green on the other side. We think freedom from family and society makes us happy, but society tries to tame us. Tolstoy, by not telling us about Anna's unhappiness before she meets Vronsky, tries to show that it's not a good choice to abandon your partner and child for your own hedonistic pleasures. Tolstoy uses Vronsky to test Anna. When she meets him, she realizes her dissatisfaction with her husband, her unhappiness, and how bored she is. You could say bad influence, like bad friends make you do bad things. But you could also say her encounter with a charming officer opens her eyes to another lifestyle. In fact, this makes us dislike Anna as a selfish, impulsive person who risks her marriage for some passion. Her husband takes his duties as a husband and father extremely seriously, but not Anna. She escapes her duties as a mother and wife. I guess Tolstoy tells us that marriage is not about happiness, it's about duty. Tolstoy warns Anna about destroying her family at the beginning of the novel. Tolstoy sends Anna to make peace between Steva and Dolly in their marriage because of the same issue, an affair. Anna ignores this. Rosemary Edmonds, the English translator, sums up the theme of the novel, quote, No one may build their happiness on another's pain. It's not your duty to make others happy, but it's certainly your duty not to make others unhappy. Levin, the other main character, is self-deprecating, humble, always assessing his life, comparing Western ideas with Russian values, and, and finally realizing that there's no perfection in this world, not in marriage, happiness, or life. Quote, if you look for perfection, you will never be satisfied. If you seek perfection in anything, you are bound to fail. Trains are new in Russia. From St. Petersburg to Moscow would have taken days, now takes hours. This messes up your psyche. You desire things faster. Anna is the victim of railway technology that speeded up time. 
literally as she died in front of the tree, but also metaphorically as she becomes less and less patient with her unhappiness. So you could say that the third most important character in Anna Karenina is the railway in Russia. Anna's marriage is like a boring station. Vronsky station, however, is full of adventures, happier, greener and more lush. We all switch jobs, partners, even jump over borders to other countries in pursuit of something better. So Tolstoy, like many people at the time, saw trains the enemy of simple happiness. Today we might say the internet has done the same thing. We want instant gratification. The parallel is here. Today social media has speeded up things even more. As soon as Anna started comparing Vronsky to her husband, she lost the battle. After other people, you are your worst enemy. Your worst enemy of good result is your conscious pursuit. Tolstoy believed in human intuition, a kind of mystical power that is better than your rational mind. We saw in War and Peace, General Kutuzov believed in the spirit of the army, like a mystical power that no battle tactic or modern thinking could replace. In Anna Karenina, we see Levin applies the same thing in farming. Here's a quote. Another row and yet another row followed long rows and short rows with good grass with poor grass. Levin lost all sense of time and he could not have told whether it was late or early now. A change began to come over his work which gave him immense satisfaction. In the midst of his toil there were moments during which he forgot what he was doing and it came all easy to him. But as soon as he recollected what he was doing and began trying to do better, he was at once conscious of all the difficulty of his task and the row was badly mown. When you're absorbed, time flies. When you consciously seek happiness, it moves further away from you. Modernity gives us the false premise of putting our happiness and fulfillment as our conscious goal. Instead, we should derive our fulfillment from what we do, in other words, from our duties towards others, be it your partner, customer, viewer, child, friends, or family. So Anna, one man's wife, another man's lover, yet another man's sister, and one's mother, wanted to be free. Tolstoy tells us we are never free from society. Society is our doom and salvation, our source of misery and intense happiness. It all depends how you navigate the spider web of social fabrics.